Hi fellow travelers, this is Lisa again, popping in on the Feast of St. Philomena because my feast day not-so-quick take felt lacking, specifically in miracles. Because I had already run over 30 minutes on the biographical quick take, I thought it might be acceptable to record an addendum reading from the archives of the official shrine of St. Philomena in Mugnano. The following is entirely quoted. Miracles corroborated by official acts and authoritative recognitions from popes, bishops, and important people. Healing of the lawyer Alexander Serio, his gift of the altar, and the prodigy of the marble table miraculously repaired. This miracle is also described by Ippolito, quote, Another great devotee of St. Philomena was a certain Neapolitan lawyer, D. Alessandro Seria, who in the year 1814 was in Mugnano with his wife, Lady Giovanna Fusco, for their holidays. He had been suffering for many years from a serious internal illness, and through the intercession of the saint he was hoping for a full recovery. For this reason he prayed with fervor at the saint's altar. This continued for eight days, when he was suddenly struck by severe abdominal pains, and he was instantly taken home and placed in bed. The illness grew so much worse that in a few hours he had little time left to live without the possibility of confession. Concerned by so much pain, his spouse took a frame with a picture of the saint and placed it on her husband's body, begging for the grace of seeing him pass away at least with the holy sacraments, and promising to have an altar in the chapel of St. Philomena made of marble. In that instant, Serio's responsiveness returned, and he was completely out of danger. During his sacrament of confession, the deadly pain disappeared completely, and with it, the old disease. In the meantime, the work of the marble altar started. In favor with the grateful mercy received by the Serio family and the saint marked this work with a particular prodigy. The required materials were obtained, all made of the finest marble and rare stones. The work began and had already reached the, of the stage of positioning the top made of one single marble slab, when the marble worker, Giovanni Simafonte, grooving for the positioning of the sacred stone, cracked the marble slab in the middle with the first blow of the chisel for three-quarters the length of the slab. At this unexpected misfortune, the craftsman was worried, not so much for his reputation, but more for his job, since he believed that it was impossible to continue the work, expecting, with a success of blows, that the remaining intact part of the slab would break too. With the use of an iron bar, he even tried to reinforce the side where the crack was, which was wider than a finger, and he tried to tighten it as much as he could. He continued with his work with the help of drills, and the sacred stone was slotted in the appropriate groove. It still had the crack, more than a finger wide. But then another prodigy. While the hand of the worker filled the crack, the invisible hand of the saint restored the marble, joining both parts and leaving only a very thin line to evidence the miracle, so that it looked like a natural marble vein. This prodigy took place in a public church in front of many citizens. The news traveled throughout the whole village, and one of the witnesses took the slab from the table that was first cracked and then restored, showed it to the crowd, and hitting it with a sledgehammer let the crowd hear the sound that was that of a whole marble. Miracle of the Sweating of St. Philomena's Statue in 1806, Cardinal Louis Rufo Silla, who lived from 1750 to 1832, Archbishop of Naples from 1802 to 1832, donated a wooden statue of St. Philomena to the sanctuary, containing in its chest cavity a reliquary which enclosed a small bone particle belonging to the martyr, as reported by Ippolito. This statue is brought every year in procession through the streets of Mugnano on the second Sunday of August. On August 10, 1823, during the procession, the statue became heavier. The next day, the statue sweated fragrant manna for three consecutive days. Regarding this, there are two public records, one signed by Vicar Foreneo and by 17 priests of the clergy of Mugnano, the other by the mayor, the chancellor, and from members of the council. These records were deposited in the municipal archive and in Our Lady of Grace Church in Mugnano. Miracle in the Church of the Caesarea in Naples of the Statue of St. Philomena's Facial Transformations 
In June 1925, the charitable Miss Maria Semantano, accompanied by her friend Maria Campare, went to the studio of the famous artist Louis de Luca, and with sincere and courageous words, she exposed her fervent wish of a statue of St. Philomena for the Church of the Caesarea. It was to be made of paper mache, and the artist had to create only the hands, head, and feet, since the young devotee wanted to dress the saint personally with a white dress and a purple cloak. At first he refused, saying that as he was a famous artist, he was used to making his artistic shapes in bronze and marble, not paper mache. He wanted to give full expression and life to his figure. He did not just make mutilated heads and stumps of saints. Later on, convinced by the insistence of the young woman, he accepted, and he completed the statue, which was presented on August 13, 1925. Some days later, De Luca was no longer happy with his work. While everybody praised it, he felt the need to correct it, and only on September 30th was the statue returned to the sanctuary of the Caesarea. The 1st of October was the important vigil. In the morning, there was a very animated discussion between Louis de Luca and Monsignor Fabosi, the superior of the sanctuary. The latter believed that the statue was a masterpiece, perfect features, beautiful expression, but the people would not recognize in this statue their saint, because de Luca had decided to represent an agonizing young girl, giving the image a cadaverous look, the eyelids down, the lips a purplish color. The statue represented a dying person, perhaps a heroine, but certainly not a martyr. On that lovely face there was no rosy glow or trace of mystic passion. The reason for which the statue had no life was simple. The artist did not have spiritual sensibility. Monsignor Fabozzi tried to explain to De Luca that St. Philomena was a martyr, and that martyrs in the supreme moment they are luminous, they are inflamed with love of God, they are never as alive as in the instant in which they die. De Luca did not want to listen to any of this. The barrier between them was not about a different concept of art, but a different concept of faith. The work was temporarily placed in the sacristy. During that day, it was seen by many priests, nuns, ladies of charity, and they all shared the same opinion. She was nice, she was beautiful, but she looked like a cadaver. The same young ladies who had ordered the statue were unhappy and tried to persuade the artist to color her up a little, but when they heard that this would have requested more time, they decided to leave it as it was. Disappointed, they asked Deluca to personally place the purple cloak artistically on the statue. The next day was the 2nd of October, the Feast of the Angels, and Monsignor Fabozzi was celebrating Mass in their honor when there was an altar dedicated to them. When Father de Milo, who was to celebrate the next Mass, arrived, he did not think it was convenient to put his clothes in the sacristy during the celebration of a religious service, and contrary to his usual behavior, went in the last room. Driven by curiosity, he lifted the newspapers that covered the statue, and he too was struck by that deathly coloring. A short while later, De Luca went in, and he suddenly came out very agitated, trembling, and emotionally moved. Turning to Monsignor Fabozzi, he asked who had modified the statue. The priest told him that nobody had retouched it, but seeing that he was not convinced, they both went into the last room. He, too, was astonished. The image was no longer the same. The features had remained the same, but on them an unknown hand had spread an extremely delicate rose shade. It was subtle pink and virginal. The color was not uniform. Only the cheeks, the nostrils, the chin, even under the nails, had this astounding shading. These were not patches, but admirably artistic. Particularly surprising were the lips. The purplish color had disappeared, and there was now a pinkish color, not uniform, but full of different shades and tones. The statue was fully dry, as if it had been painted over fifteen days before. As a matter of fact, the hair that De Luca had placed the week earlier was still sticky, while the face, painted now by a mysterious brush, was completely dry. They tried to give little publicity to the event because they wanted to study the surprising phenomenon. In the daily newspaper, the Roma, there was an article that suggested a check to verify this. If De Luca still had leftovers of the colors used for the statue, why not paint a head, place it in the same environmental conditions, and then verify after a few days what happened? 
The experiment was immediately accepted and was carried out with scientific standards. The head of a statue was painted with the leftover of the colors used by De Luca, using the maximum precaution. A few days later, the seals were removed. The result was verified. The head had remained yellow, pale, cadaverous. At this point, somebody talked about chemical reaction. De Luca was questioned, and they asked him what materials he had used for the painting. He declared that he had used yellow clay and silver grout, adding some amber and some green clay. Mixing the yellow clay with the bleak silver grout, he had achieved a pale color, nearly cadaverish. He gave three coatings of this paint to the work, leaving some days in between each one of them to allow for each coating of color to dry properly. With such technical and chemical elements, it was impossible to have a reaction so anomalous to generate a pinkish color. What had happened was supernatural. The miracle of the multiplication of the saints' relics in the hands of Monsignor Anselmo Basilisi, Bishop of Sutri and Nepi. Monsignor Anselmo Basilisi, Bishop of Sutri and Nepi, was a tireless promoter of the cult of St. Philomena. Following his request, Pope Gregory XVI, in the year 1834, arranged that the Sacred Congregation of Rites examine the reasons to concede the indult of the Mass of St. Philomena's office in various dioceses, which was subsequently granted. Monsignor Basilisi had received a few relics from Mugnano and wanted to divide them between the churches of his diocese. He wanted to please all applicants, but he did not know how. At this point, the relics prodigiously multiplied themselves, as he later declared with one of his own certificates when he came to visit the sanctuary of Mugnano on May 31, 1835. He also declared that he received requests about relics from the cardinals Odelashkashi and Falsakapa, Wells and Pandolfi, as well as several bishops, to promote the devotion, and that he managed to meet the demands of everybody. On June 16, 1835, Gregory XVI received an audience, the same bishop, to be informed with documented report on this prodigious event. The Pope, moved, ordered Cardinal Pedicini, Prefect in the Sacred Congregation of Rites, to verify the matter. The next day, June 17, in absence of Cardinal Pedicini, the division of the dust belonging to the sacred body of St. Philomena was solemnly carried out by Cardinal Jaleffi, the vice prefect, in front of many witnesses who confirmed the prodigy. The miracle of the healing of Franciscan sister Maria Gesualdi Garelli. When Monsignor Anselmo Basilisi on June 16, 1835, came to Rome to the Holy See to report to the Pope about the prodigy of St. Philomena's relics, the saint was already highly venerated and well known in Rome. Amongst the many miracles performed in the Eternal City, we remember the one about the Franciscan sister, Maria Gesualda Carelli, because it was certified by two eminent cardinals. This religious Franciscan had received the last sacraments because she was so ill that she could no longer open her eyes and feed herself. Everybody was just waiting for her to die. When her confessor applied on the agonizing face an image of St. Philomena, instantaneously Sister Maria Gesualda sat on the bed and shouted, I am healed. The Cardinal Jaleffi, protector of the Monastery of the Saints Cosma and Damion, ascertained the healing on the spot, and Cardinal Zerla, vicar of his sanctity, dealt with the necessary legal information. Miraculous healing of Giovanna Sescuti in Venice in 1835 for the intercession of St. Philomena. Giovanna Sescuti was a young woman of about 20 years of age who lived in Venice. She suffered various illnesses which could not be cured. She suffered extreme pains which often left her at death's door. One day she was stricken by a sudden illness. She was at the end of her tether. In the evening of the 6th of July, 1835, the parish priest of Santa Maria de Giglio, Don Antonio Magnana, who had been assisting the woman for a long time, called in her family to recite to St. Philomena a prayer which was barely voiced by the sick woman, who was so weak that she could follow him only with her mind and heart. It was around eleven in the evening, and the parish priest ended the prayers of the sick, and thinking that the woman had passed away, asked the people there to recite together three Our Fathers in honor of St. Philomena. Once it was over, she got up from her supine position in which she had been laying the whole day, and with a clear and vigorous voice she proclaimed, Oh dear, I am better. Thanks to God I am in good health again after ten years' suffering. 
This instant recovery from all her incurable illnesses was of great amazement to all, and it was confirmed by well-known doctors. On the 16th of July, 1835, the miraculously cured woman went to Santa Maria del Giglio to thank solemnly God in the church. An epigraph in Latin was also placed in the church praising St. Philomena. The healing obtained by the blessed Anne-Marie Taigi. The blessed Anne-Marie Taigi was a fervent devotee of St. Philomena, and she often experienced her powerful intercession in person. One of her granddaughters, Peppina, daughter of her oldest child, Sophia, injured one of her eyes. This is how the husband of the blessed Anna Maria, Peppina's grandfather, told of this miracle at the beatification process. Quote, I remember that Peppina, Sophia's daughter, injured one of her eyes. The doctor said that her pupil had been lacerated and there was no hope of healing. The servant of God, Anna Maria, made the sign of the cross with the oil of St. Philomena, placed her hand on the girl's head, and sent her to bed. Peppina slept very well without feeling any pain, and the next day her eye had healed so perfectly that she managed to go to school to the pious teachers of Jesus. The skeptical surgeons decided to perform different tests to ensure she could see. The Miracle of the Cure to Ars between St. Philomena and the Cure to Ars, an important relationship was established. This relationship is so important that the figure of the Cure to Ars becomes incomprehensible if his huge devotion to his dear little saint is not taken into consideration. This bond has something of the prodigious about it. St. Philomena's miracle toward the Cure to Ars was multiform. First of all, the St. Philomena apparition to the Cure to Ars. Second, the miraculous healing of the cure by St. Philomena's intercession. And third, the miraculous healings that happened in Ars following the cure's urging to turn to St. Philomena. The first, apparition to St. John Raviani, the Cure to Ars. The Cure to Ars didn't want people talking too much about extraordinary events in his life. Etienne Duria, who in front of the court of inquiry reported to have heard the curé speak loudly to Our Lady, as soon as Vianney realized he had been caught, he admonished Etienne with assertive tone, quote, If you talk about this, you'll never step into this house again. And in a more subdued tone, he added, With the Holy Virgin and with St. Philomena, we know each other pretty well. After the apparition that the curé had during the illness of May 1843, that the cure to ours knew what the saint looked like can be deduced from the testimony of Miss Sophia McCushin, who, having asked him during confession for an image of St. Philomena, heard him reply, quote, But in your church of Ligny there is a picture that represents her. Go and have it copied. It is the most beautiful head of the saint that I know. Trochu added that he was not aware of the curé ever having been to Ligny, and that for what he knew, he could not have had any knowledge of the existence of that picture, dated 1836. Therefore, the curé must have known it by mysterious ways. The Miraculous Healing of the Cure to Ars This is how it's described by the rector Don Gennaro Ippolito, copying from the work of the abbot Monin. Quote, it was the beginning of May, 1843. The venerable curé, without anyone to help him, succumbed, exhausted, under the weight of the huge amount of people that would come to him for confession. During Mary's month, he used to go on the pulpit every night and address the gathered faithful. The third day, he felt so ill in the middle of his speech that he had to stop. He tried to do a reading, but he could not finish it. He began the prayer, and his voice and strength failed him completely. He came down struggling from the pulpit, went to bed, and soon the worst symptoms started to show. On May 6th, it was reported that his illness was extremely serious, and the whole parish was in tears and prayers. The abbot Bernard on May 10th stated that in every part of the village reigned a gloomy silence. Consternation was visible on all faces. The pilgrims wandered on the square and around the church like a herd without a shepherd. As soon as the male nurses would appear, everybody would surround them, saying, How is the saint? How is our good father? There were about two or three hundred who had not been confessed by the abbot Vianney. At the answer that there had not been any improvements, they would enter the church, forcing their way into heaven and imploring the Lord with the intercession of the Virgin and St. Philomena for a full recovery of someone so dear. The fifth day of the illness, there was a consultation. It was confirmed by the previous and present symptoms of the illness the existence of a pleura pneumonia at the bottom of the right lung, at the front and the back. Due to the fatal events that the doctors predicted and their diagnosis foreshadowed, it was thought that administration of the sacraments had to be hastened. 
The following day, after this imposing ceremony, the cure of Farvarius was celebrating the Mass at the altar of St. Philomena. At the same time, the curé, who had never been without a temperature for the first time, fell peacefully asleep. From that moment, he felt better and better until fully recovered. It was the general opinion that St. Philomena had appeared to him, and that in a mysterious conversation things were said, and these were the consolation of the priest until the end of his life. The testimony of the school teacher who was at his bedside day and night is as follows. Quote, Our holy curé, feeling that he was at the end of his life, wanted a mass to be celebrated in honor of St. Philomena, to whom he had consecrated himself with a special vow. A nearby priest was called to say it, and all the people of ours, of foreigners and locals, attended. Before the mass began, the curé looked like a frightened man. I noticed something extraordinary, a great anxiety, an unusual disturbance. I observed all his movements with my attention. I thought that the fatal time had arrived and that he was going to give his last breath. But as soon as the priest went onto the altar, he suddenly looked calmer, like a man who had seen something pleasant and reassuring. The Mass had just ended when he exclaimed, My friend, there has been a big change in me. I am fully recovered. I felt an immense joy in hearing those words. I was still convinced that he had had a vision, since I had more than once heard him murmur the name of his sweet protector, which made me think that St. Philomena had appeared to him, but I did not dare question him. The following days brought a big improvement to the curé, who attributed his recovery to the intercession of St. Philomena. On Friday, May 19th, he had himself taken to the church. He fell on his knees in front of the altar and was submerged in sentiments of adoration and gratitude with acceptance of the Lord's will, who wanted him to live and to continue his work. As he had adored God, he went to prostrate himself in the chapel of his dear saint, where he prayed now for a long time with admirable fervor and consolation. Amongst the miracles received by the curate from the saint, we remember the one that took place three years before his death when the devil set his bed on fire, and he, aware of this, did not panic. In this fire the flame stopped in front of St. Philomena's reliquary, and from that point the fire left a straight line from top to bottom of symmetric precision, destroying everything that was on one side and sparing all that was on the other side of the saint's relic. Miraculous Healings in Ours by the Intercession of St. Philomena the chapel in ours named after St. Philomena is so full of crutches and other ex photo as proof of the miracles operated there to justify the telling off of the curé to the saints for performing too many miracles. Monsignor Gennaro Ippolito writes, In the month of May 1843, one of Mulan's ecclesiastics who came to ours was suffering with tuberculosis in its last stages. The abbot Vianney had told him that he would not recover and that he was destined for heaven. Even though the prognosis was so frightening, the good priest decided to stay in ours awaiting the end of his suffering, invoking mercy from God Omnipotent. This priest, during the holy curé's illness, had been of great assistance in the most critical days, never refusing his time or help. Now that the curé had recovered, he said to the good priest, My dear friend, you were so charitable during my illness that the Lord has changed his plans for you. You will recover. In one of the churches of your city you'll dedicate a statue to St. Philomena, and you'll ensure that the parish chosen by you consecrates a chapel to her. This will be your way of saying thank you. And the cure of ours prediction was fulfilled. Healing of Cripples on August 9, 1848, in the Church of Ars, through St. Philomena's intercession, Anthony Cahard, aged seven years, got the use of his legs. On July 24, 1848, in St. Philomena's Chapel, a little girl of 12 years, Frances Violet, regained the use of her legs, which had been lost five months earlier because of a serious illness. Laid on a chair, after receiving the Holy Eucharist, she started to walk in the church a few moments later without any support. Another instantaneous healing took place in the summer of 1858, and the witnesses were all pilgrims and the inhabitants of ours. A young man from Puy de Dome, who could hardly walk even with the help of crutches, presented himself to the Holy Curé and was encouraged to have faith in the saint. On the day of the Assumption, to everyone's amazement, he put down the crutches at the feet of St. Philomena's altar, and he never used them again. Moved by gratitude, he then worked at Belly in the Brothers of the Holy Family Institute. 
Similar healing was received by another young man in August of 1858. Carl Blasi of Sebazat of the Claremont Diocese was deprived of the use of both legs in 1855. He was transported in a coach and then in a train to the sanctuary of Ars, where he completed his novena to the saint. He returned from Ars fully recovered after having laid down his crutches in St. Philomena's Chapel. He managed to walk without any effort for the 18 kilometers to return home. At St. Philomena's tomb, a lamp is constantly burning, and its oil is donated every year to a different Italian or worldwide city. Some faithful anointed with the oil of this lamp have been healed. For these prodigies, the devotion of St. Philomena's oil was born, which is used to anoint the sick part of a body, for which the healing is invoked through the intercession of St. Philomena. In Naples, a noble woman had been sorely tried by her body. A hand ulcer had turned into cancer. Amputation was urgently required. All preparations had been carried out for the operation. By evening, the pious woman, recalling that the early Christians would place on the affected part of the body some kind of a relic of a martyr to heal it, she applied on her horrible sore a small particle of St. Philomena's relics. The next morning, the surgeon, uncovering with caution the patient's hand, realized with wonder that the ulcer was no longer there. The hand was rosy and healthy like a baby's. A verbal process of this healing was written down by the public notary Antonio Montori. The Healing of a Crippled Boy, Eight Days After the Translation, 1805. This is how this miracle is described by Monsignor Gennaro Ippolito, rector of the sanctuary. In the last of the eight days during the celebration of the solemn mass, at the moment the sacred host was raised, suddenly beside the widow Angelo Giorario from the village of Mersogliano and her only son Modestino of about ten years of age, crippled in such a way that he could not even stand, stood up. His mother had brought him to the church with the hope of having him healed. The mother, watching him walking quickly to reach the urn full of joy, began shouting, A miracle! A miracle! All the people who knew the boy and his inability to walk repeated the same words. Then the boy was taken all around the village, walking and acclaiming by himself. A crowd of incredulous people were following him. The Healing of a Blind Girl it is once again Ippolito reporting this. In the Vespers of the same day, the eighth day after the translation of 1805, the size of the crowd that attended was incredible. The majority, not being able to enter the church, was forced to stay outside. During the preaching of Father Antonio Vatrani, missionary of the Congregation of St. Peter of Cesarano in the Magnano area, a woman from Avella was allowed into the church with her little girl of about two years, blind because of smallpox and considered incurable by the main doctors of Naples. As soon as the mother was close to the sacred urn, she applied the oil from the lamp on her girl's eyes, who in that instant recovered her eyesight. Both mother and daughter started to shout, the daughter with happiness, the mother with faith. Instantly, inside and outside the church, the news of the miracle began to spread, and the crowd were in turmoil with curiosity. There was a man present who'd had the reputation of a non-believer. Struck by the marvel he had witnessed, he offered spontaneously to help financially with the erection of the chapel that for some time had been planned to be built for the saint's cult. Here we have two miracles, the opening of the eyes of an innocent girl and the opening of the eyes of the soul of a sinner. The healing of canonical Monsignor Don Joseph Stella, the assistant of the Archbishop of Imola, Monsignor Giovanni Maria Mastei Ferretti, who was later Pope Pius IX. It is once again the rector of the sanctuary, Father Gennaro Ippolito, who describes this. The canonical Monsignor Don Joseph Stella, great devotee of St. Philomena, and propagator of her cult in that city in the year 1834, was ready to close his eyes for the last time and to meet his maker. When looking at a picture of the saint that he had near his bed, he sincerely invoked her. The divine protectress, with particular sign, informed him that she was donating him full recovery. Healed, he decided to go in person to the sanctuary in Mugnano to give thanks to the saint, and he remained for six days to fulfill this duty. His health remained perfect, and he provided important services to the reigning highest pontiff, Pius IX, for over forty years, and in the month of July 1870, occupying the post of wardrobe valet to the Pope at a respected age, he passed on to a better life. Resurrection from the Dead of an Eight-Year-Old Boy It is again Ippolito that writes, 
Rosa de Lucia, a noblewoman of Munana, cousin of Father Francesco, the caretaker of the sacred body of St. Filomino, one day, while holding one of her sons, only eight years old, who had been ill for a long time, saw him passing away in her motherly arms. After having wet the cold corpse with the warmest of tears, and having made sure there was no trace of life, animated by true faith, she took the dear image of the thaumaturgic saint, and placed it on the small body of her deceased son. With loud screams and uncontrollable crying, she kept begging for the grace of life, and the son, like someone waking up after a deep lethargic sleep, rose again to new life and gave himself to the love of his mother. His health remained perfect. He provided important services to the reigning highest pontiff, Pope Pius IX, for forty years, and in the month of July 1870, occupying the post of wardrobe ballot to the Pope, at a respected age, he passed on to a better life. A fire extinguished due to the presence of St. Philomena's image. Monsignor Joseph Senior, the Bishop of Marcy, wrote this to the rector of the sanctuary of Mugnano. We have had another miracle happening in my area of Poggio Genolfo, where there has been devotion to St. Philomena, and was displayed to the public in May 1834 with a solemnity of an image of the saint. On November 8th, a fire broke out in the fireplace of Giuseppe Lorenzi. It was inextinguishable by human hands. It was about midday and threatened the houses nearby, causing screams and cries from the frightened neighbors. The consternation was so great that the church bells were rung to gather the people and protect them from danger. Although water and mud were being used and it was raining, the ruinous flame became hungrier and more terrible. Then a general cry arose from the crowd with these words, Bring the image of St. Philomena. Immediately the priest, my nephew, Father Cosmasenia, was called. He quickly took a paper image that he had in his domestic oratory, rushed over with incredible speed, went into the house, passing amongst the swarming crowd, and said, Here is St. Philomena. And publicly he threw the image into the burning fireplace. And as if pushed by the wind, it was seen rising high above the flames inside the chimney, and she disappeared from everyone's view. After watching this, all the onlookers were anxious and alarmed, and each one of them thought about transporting their belongings out of their homes so that the fire would not destroy and incinerate them, because it looked as if it would expand to the whole village. When against all expectations, after about no more than five or six minutes, suddenly the threatening flame was extinguished, and everyone present saw the sacred image of St. Philomena return. It came down the chimney like a dove of peace, fluttered across the room, and settled on the left side of the fireplace, untouched and unaltered by the fire, like a trophy victorious against the voracious flames. The observing crowd exclaimed full of admiration, O oh, great miracle of St. Philomena! And with highest veneration, everybody tried to kiss the prodigious image. Now, last but not least... From St. Philomena, the little wonder worker of the 20th century. Quote, the story of the shrine of St. Philomena. The story of the shrine of St. Philomena and of the remarkable manifestations associated with it possesses a unique interest among narratives of the kind. Much of it might indeed be difficult to accept without question were not the authority in its support so strong. The first in time of the favors we shall record is assigned to a date shortly after the translation of the relics of the St. Tumaniano. While at Naples, as we may remember, the bones of the virgin martyr were placed within a figure of childlike form, which was enclosed in an ebony casket. The casket being of small dimensions, the figure, though not larger than a child of about eight years of age, had to be placed in a cramped and ungraceful position. One morning, however, shortly after the arrival of the saint within the chapel of Pignano, to the amazement of some clients who had come to pay their homage at her shrine, the figure was found to have changed its attitude and whole appearance. Originally, it had lain flat within the case, the effect aimed at being that of the repose of death. Now the representation of the saint had mysteriously assumed a half-sitting posture, full of majesty and grace, the face being turned toward the spectators. The hands, too, had changed their position, the arrow, the emblems of martyrdom which had been placed in one of them, being reversed. In a word, the whole figure had become different. But the most striking marvel of the transformation was that the countenance no longer continued the same. 
The artist by whom the figure had originally been designed in Naples had done his work hastily, and the features, imperfectly modeled, had been colored to represent the pallor of a corpse. All these defects now disappeared, and an expression of great beauty took their place, while the colorless hue, which the face had hitherto presented, changed into a soft, lifelike complexion. And all the while, the four seals which had been attached to the casket by the Bishop of Potenza were intact, and the glass which surrounded it could not have been removed. The rumor of this occurrence, having quickly spread abroad, soon reached Naples. On hearing of the marvelous event, the members of the Therese family, by whom the figure of St. Philomena had been at first dressed, accompanied by the artist who had designed and painted it, together with some others set out for Mugnano. It was beyond doubt that the key of the reliquary which the Signora Therese, the custodian, held had never left her possession, and yet all attested that in no way was the attitude or the appearance of the martyr like what it had been when the relics had left their home in Naples. Further changes were subsequently, from time to time, observed in the position of the miraculous figure. Thus, some years after, when the garments in which the saint was clothed began to look worn and faded, another extraordinary circumstance occurred. The stitched seams loosened of themselves. The rich trimmings and accessories became detached, till at length, little by little, the whole vestiture became disordered and scattered. The final and complete disarrangement of the exterior of the little figure took place about the Feast of Pentecost, 1824, when Don Francesco decided on having the relics arrayed in a new and costly attire, and also provided a larger and more elegant shrine to receive them. Previous to the opening of the old reliquary, it was observed that the silken hair on the head of the saint had become sparse and scanty. As the date fixed for the translation of the relics was close at hand, no time remained to procure fresh silken hair. Then another wonder took place. An abundance of flowing tresses made their appearance before the beginning of the ceremony, which was carried out with great devotion and splendor by the Archbishop and his suite, in presence of the Vicar General of the Diocese, on July 5, 1824. Some time after the occurrence of this prodigy, this silken hair, which had been a chestnut shade, suddenly turned to a deep black. At the same time, the flowing tresses grew to such a length that it became necessary to open the case to rearrange them over the shoulders. In 1833, nine years after the second dressing of the figure, the hair was found to have grown 27 inches. Soon again, a further development manifested itself. Another and larger shrine was deemed insufficient owing to the increased proportions of the wondrous figure of the occupant. A new receptacle was therefore again procured. On this occasion, Monsignor Cupola, Bishop of Vola, whose veneration for St. Philomena bordered almost on enthusiasm, came to Magnano to place as an offering a rich crown of silver on her head. On this occasion, a similar miracle again took place. On the 27th of September, 1828, Cardinal Rufo Silla, Archbishop of Naples, opened the shrine and removed the relics to the beautiful and spacious case where they have since rested. From the appearance of a child of tender years, as our saint was first represented, she had now grown to bear the appearance of a beautiful maiden of twenty. When the Cardinal Archbishop of Naples, in fulfillment of a vow, came to Magnano for a fifth time, he declared after he had celebrated Mass in presence of the shrine that since he had sealed the reliquary six months before, the holy form of the saint had changed anew its appearance. Miraculous manifestations after that time became so frequent as to be regarded as a matter of course. Sometimes the countenance lost its habitual brightness of expression and became overcast and sad. The lips, too, of the saint were seen at times to move as if in prayer, in union, with the supplication of her clients. During the celebration of the annual festival in 1847, among the vast congregation was a poor blind man who was fervently imploring the saint to procure for him the recovery of his sight. Suddenly the whole body was seen to move, turning on its side to face the congregation. This event was attested by numerous witnesses, and after careful inquiries solemnly published. This attestation concludes as follows, quote, we can testify that similar changes are continually occurring. Either the opening of the eyes, the movement of the lips, or varied expressions of the countenance, which sometimes appears pale and sad, sometimes pleased and bright. 
He who will not believe what is stated should himself repair to the sanctuary where he will see with his own eyes how God glorifies his saints. End quote. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. Saint Philomena, powerful with God, pray for us.